Well, good evening, Hearth and Homies. Thanks for joining us for tonight's live compilation. Tonight, we're featuring the show Cloak and Dagger. This old time radio classic features some real stories direct from the files of the OSS during World War II. Now, this is volume two of Cloak and Dagger. If you haven't seen volume one yet, feel free to check it out. I'll put a link up here. Now, this series was based on the 1946 book Cloak and Dagger, the secret story of the OSS, written by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. In all, there were 22 episodes produced, all of which broadcast during 1950. Now, the show was not able to pick up a sponsor, so it only lasted for one season. One interesting note about the show is the theme music that was used for this show was also used in Tales of the Texas Rangers, which was another great NBC radio show. Now, I just want to take a minute and mention some exciting stuff now that we have over on Patreon. Of course, you know this channel is totally supported by viewers like you. I know YouTube is free, but it does cost time and money to make a channel like this. And Hearth and Home Entertainment is currently not monetized by YouTube. So your support helps in a big way to keep this channel going. One way you can support the channel is by clicking the links below. For Patreon, you can join the Johnny Dollar Club for as little as a dollar a month. Or we've got a couple new support levels for those of you that are able, including the radio producer level, where you can earn free exclusive channel merch throughout the year. Just check out the links in the description below to see how that works. Now for tonight's show, we've combined this classic old time radio show with the OTR visual radio to give you a unique old time radio viewing experience. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines? Knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare, Espionage, International Intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In today's adventure, The Secret Box, concerning an American agent who was sent into a Japanese-infested jungle to take back a prisoner. The role of John Marco, the OSS agent, is played by comedy star Jerry Lester. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. I always carried this little box around with me. I never knew when it might come in handy. It was about as big as a small lunch box, and... Well, to begin at the beginning... I happened to be in the radio room at OSS headquarters in Bamo that night when the message came through. How important Japanese... Captive for you. Can you come get him? Come soon. Jap patrol only few miles away. Again, for OSS headquarter in Bamo from Agent Terry. So that's how Harry Stevens and I happened to be in an AT-18 flying over Agent Terry's position about 86 miles behind enemy lines in Burma. And like I say, I had this little box in my knapsack. Oh, oh, in case I forgot to mention it, my name is Johnny Marco. Snappy songs and witty sayings. Just mention my name in Sheboygan. Oh, they loved me in Sheboygan. Yeah, yeah, I know, Marco. Hey, Harry, did I ever tell you about my last date in Frisco before I went overseas? I can hardly wait. Her name was Rose. She had a name like a flower and a face like a weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I called her cream of wheat because she was so mushy. <laughs> Marco, I have but one thing to say to you. Well, talk to me. I hope you live to be as old as your jokes. You know the trouble with you, Harry? Mm -hmm. You don't realize you're carting around a million dollars worth of talent. 
I tell you, they love me. And your boy can, I know. That's the city, yeah. Now, hang on. I'm gonna take a dive, see if I can find the landing strip. We had figured our checkpoints carefully. But when we reached our rendezvous, all we could see was a rough field with a Buddhist pagoda at the far end. Nothing else. No landing strip, no markers, no one waiting downstairs. Just a rough field covered with brush. We knew something must have gone wrong. I don't get it, Marco. Well, the Japs probably closed in and they're afraid to come out of hiding. Oh, great. Live Jap prisoners aren't dropped in our laps every day. Hey, Harry. Huh? Who is this Agent Terry, anyway? Oh, missionary. He's been working with a tribe of Anglo-Burmese for years. Colonel says he's already radioed back a lot of information on enemy positions. This is the first prisoner he's ever taken. What a rotten break. Well, look, circle around again. Maybe we'll see something. Nope. Better head back before we run into trouble ourselves. Hey, Harry, huh? Harry, look. Look, the brush. It's being yanked away. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Look, those natives. They're putting up the white marker stripes. The safe-to-land panel's out it. Gee, it's like seeing something pop before your eyes. Let's go. That landing strip came out of nowhere. Just all of a sudden, there it was. The plane bumped the ground and rolled in. But we kept the motor still running in case of a Jap trek. And we sat there and waited for whatever was going to happen next. Harry, Harry, look, look, look. Something or somebody's coming out of that clump of bamboo at the end of the field. Yeah. Keep your hand on your gun. I'll make a quick getaway if I have to. Check, check. Harry! Harry, natives! Yeah, but are they friendly? Spears! Hey, they're armed. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? There's a white woman with them. I am Mrs. Terry, gentlemen. One would never suspect I was an agent who had won. Well, uh, what's the angle? I mean, well, I beg your pardon, oh, ma'am. Oh, it's very simple, really. My husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry, a God-fearing man, went to his rest a few months ago. Well, you mean, ma'am, that, that you're the agent who's been sending all that information to OSS headquarters in Bamo? Naturally. Hmm. Uh, this is Lin Tao. I suppose you'd call him the right-hand man. Say, how'd you do, Lin? How you do? Hi. <laughs> Lynn, incidentally, sent the radio message. He does so enjoy tinkering with mechanical devices. I showed him how to use it. Unfortunately, however, my husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry, a God-fearing man, was the only one of us who knew how to take it apart and put it together again. Uh, Lynn. Yes, Miss Terry? That radio, you have it? I uh, have it here. Excellent. Captain, uh, would you either have this replaced in Bummo with new parts or have a new radio dropped over to us? Why, sure, Mrs. Terry. I'll see what can be done for you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, fancy. I almost forgot. We have a Japanese prisoner for you. There were about a half a dozen natives a short distance away standing around the cart. In it, they had a Jap officer with his hands and feet tied. They dragged him over. Get down. He was a surly character. <laughs> Maybe I would be under the same circumstances. Anyway, he didn't say a word. Just glared at us from under the bloody bandage around his head. Here is your guest, gentlemen. Colonel Sawaka, the Japanese high command. He uh, resisted arrest rather strenuously, so it was impossible to avoid banging him around a bit. <laughs> Well, goodbye now, and good luck, and do give my regards to your colonel. We loaded Colonel Sawaka into the small plane. And a few seconds later, as we swung over the field, we looked down and saw that all trace of the strip had completely disappeared. The brush was replaced, and there was nothing. Only jungle. How's our friend Colonel Sawaka doing, Marco? Well, he's a little tied up at the moment. Hey, friend, how you doing? <laughs> friend doesn't want to talk. You know something? 
That's the best audience you'll ever have, Marco. One who can't understand English. Oh, come on now, will you, Harry? Hey, maybe you got some. Hey, friend. Uh, did you know that the former ruler of Russia was called the Tsar? His wife was called the Tsarina? And you know what they called his kids? <laughs> Get a load of this. Zardines. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. You know, I think you're right, Harry. Friend obviously doesn't understand a word of comedy English. Oh, hey, what's that? Jap back act. They've spotted us. Can we get away from them? Uh, we can try. That's climbing, Harry. Gee, a thousand feet in about a half a minute. Ah, it's no good. Can't get out of range this way. Well, what do we do? I'll level off and head for home. I can't get away from them. I'm just climbing. You did it. We're out of range now. Uh, I, I, I uh, think. I just spoke too fast. Trouble? Ah, uh, Black must have hit one of the engines. It's knocked out. Oh, fine. Well, it could have been worse. I can get us back on one. Oh, brother, if you were your sister, I'd marry you. Oh, you're a big-hearted guy. You know that, Marco. Well, I don't go around All proposing right. every day. You, you better go back and see how friend is doing. When the Colonel Sawaka doing extremely well, thank you. What? Give me your hands on the flying instruments, Captain. Hey! And you, Lieutenant, give me your hands in the air. Way in the air. I thank you. Oh, you dirty dog face. You spoke English all the time. Enough to tell you that if you do not do as you are told, I put the bullet through your head. I thank you, Lieutenant. For leaving gun within easy reach. Can you do anything more? Quiet. Nothing. He's got us. Quiet. Do not talk. Just continue to fly a plane. So Harry kept the plane steady. His back to our friend. And I just stood there and watched Colonel Sawaka as he manipulated the parachute and buckled it on. Changing the gun from one hand to the other as he put his arms through the straps of the chute. Then he opened the handle of the waist door. I will say goodbye now. It was unpleasant to ride. Why, you Hands dirt. in the air. Keep the hands in the air. Much better. <laughs> now I shoot you both. Then I jump. Yeah. Goodbye, friend. Don't forget to write. The jerk shouldn't have opened a waste off first. All I had to do was bank the plane over on its side, and we lost him. <laughs> yeah, we lost him, all right. Uh oh. His shoot open. Oh, fine. Well, uh, mission unaccomplished. Well, anyway, it was a nice ride. I'm glad you thought so. Uh-oh. Second engine couldn't take the strain of that flip-flop. Is it conking out? Yeah. It cocked. All right, hit the soap, Marco. We better bail out. I made it okay. Rolled over a couple of times when I landed and pulled the chute down. But it was another story with Harry. As he bailed out, his, his, his slipstream caught him, flung him back against the horizontal stabilizer and cut a gash in his head. Miraculously, his chute opened, and he drifted into the green jungle and landed upside down in the top of a tall mahogany tree. Harry! Harry, are you all right? Can you talk? Mark, shroud line of the chute, it tangled... Can't get out. My head, I cut it. Yeah, I see. Mark, I'll get me down. Yeah, yeah, easy boy now. I'll do something. Something? But what? I tried to climb the tree to reach him. But it was no use. The trunk was bare, smooth. And I kept slipping back. It was as if the two of us were in the middle of a nightmare. Harry! Harry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can't climb that lousy tree. It's too slippery. There's nothing for me to hold on. Marco, it's no use. Well, what do you mean it's no if use? If you waste time standing there, you'll be caught. The Jap's all around. You know that as well as I do. Harry, will you listen to now me? Now you listen to me. Get away now, will you? You may have seen the plane. Oh, shut up. Now, will you shut up? Get out of with both dead ducks. I know I am anyway. Just do one thing. Marco? Yeah? Don't leave me here to starve or fall into Jap hands. Maybe you can make it back alone. You're nuts. Now, I, I couldn't do that. Just don't leave me to starve, Marco. Please. Please, huh? Shoot me first. 
Throw the head, Marco. Please. I knew he was right. I couldn't leave him. Please, Marco. Not that way. And I couldn't stay. Marco! Well, I took the 45 from the holster at my belt. When I heard the dry click of the hammer being drawn back, I, I broke out in a sweat. My hands started to get wet, too. Marco! I counted one, two... Well, let's see. What? From the looks of it, we're right in time. Lin Tao and the natives went to work swiftly, knocking down a second smaller tree against the mahogany. They scaled it like cats to the base of the branch where Harry was hanging, tossed a loop of rat tan across the branch and pulled a toward him. Then they lifted Harry and passed him from hand to hand and lowered him gently to the ground. And all the time I just stood there next to Mrs. Terry, feeling the blood pounding in my head. And I put the pistol back into my holster. Lynn, that other bandage, please. Here. Here you are, Miss Terry. That's a good fellow. Thank you so much. Uh, how's your head now, Captain Stevens? Oh, much better, thanks. I still don't understand. How did you oh, happen... we saw the Japanese Akak hit your plane almost immediately after you left us. We came along to the jungle in case this should be need of us. Lady, no one ever needed you more. You say Colonel Sawaka escaped? Dear, yeah. dear, what a pity. There oh, now, I think that bandage will do till you get back. Miss Terry. Yes, Lynn. Uh, Lynn Ta say, leave now. Do not stay. Back to village. Oh, yes, great. But that poses a problem. As I told you earlier, our radio is out of use. So, so there's no way of contacting headquarters and telling them to send a plane for us? Exactly, Lieutenant Marco. Well, uh, d d do you think we can make it back through enemy lines on foot? Mm, possibly. It'd take five or six days, anyway. Yeah, but it could be done, couldn't it? I, I, I mean, we could sneak through, couldn't we? Bypass the Japs, so I don't care. Can do. Yeah. Lin Tao help. Good. Thank you. Capital idea, Lin Tao. My husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry. A, a God-fearing God man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. He would approve heartily. <laughs> Lin Tao knew plenty of shortcuts, and we followed him, skirting Jap patrols all the way. There was something uncanny about the way he led us over miles of jungles. We kept our packs light because we had a pretty long hike ahead. But just the same, I kept that little box with me. I never knew when it might come in handy. Then we came to a small stream. Ah, uh, must go to a stream here. Take off shore. Well, well, wait a minute, Lynn. Why bother? We'll be wading through a lot of water, and, and why take our shoes off and on? Oh, what? Though, as Lynn say, if shoe get wet, feet wet all time. Many saw come on feet. Will not be easy for you to walk much distance to Bamo. We crossed several more brooks, and we kept taking our shoes off and on. On and off. The jungle along the banks grew thinner, and so did we. The sun beat down harder, and the water washed sand up around our knees. The shoes off and on, on and off. We'd splash it and then stumble, and then start walking again. A couple of days of this, we were pretty beat, except for Iron Man Lin. Ah, oh, feel good, Lin. In the sun, I'll have to hold up a while. Uh, we'll rest here, near Scream. Hey, this is an ideal spot for a picnic. <laughs> Fifty million insects can't be wrong. Ha! Got you first, you little foreigner. Hey, Marco, got any water left? My canteen's dry. Yeah, sure, here. That's all you got? It's okay, go ahead, drink it. Lynn, this is all the water we got? When Ta say, do not worry. Watch, I will show what to do so you know. Hey, wait a minute. What are you digging a hole in the sand? Watch. First, dig small hole in sand near stream. Place leave in bottom, like this. Now, when water come through, sand and leave, it not be muddy. Can drink. Hey, that's the greatest. The leaves act like a filter, you mean. Yeah, water is clear. 
Uh, drink it with your hand. Uh, we'll not hurt you now. This Lin Tao had a dozen cute little tricks like that. <laughs> He'd have been a riot in vaudeville. Well, the next morning we were back on the trail, pushing our way through sharp blades of grass. And all of a sudden we heard the tinkle of an iron bell. Hey, Lin, what's that? Escape book, elephant coming. Dangerous. Villager in jungle put iron bell around neck to warn. Uh, dangerous. Oh, guns, we've got guns. Let's shoot at them from no, two sides. No, 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 do not shoot. If yeah, but... Uh, not go too high, it only make elephant much angry. Do not shoot. Uh, still, the size of them. Look at the size of them. It's like being charged at by a six-story Still, building. still, do not shoot yet. O only if we must. Whew. Passed right by us. Yeah, maybe he didn't think we were worth noticing. You know something, Harry? Huh? One thing I can't figure out about an elephant. With a tail at both ends, how does he know which end to sit on? <laughs> oh, funny man. Come on, let's make time. Lin Tao did our seeing and our thinking for us. He did everything but walk for us, and we got sort of used to leaning on him. Nothing could happen to Iron Man Lin. Only it did. Oh! Lin! Lin! Harry! Harry, he's dead! That knife went right in his back! Where'd it come from? They came out of the jungle. At least 50 of them, half-naked savages carrying long stalks of bamboo that had been sharpened to deadly points. Their leader was a giant. Must have been about six foot seven. He held up his hand, and the sudden silence scared us more than the noise. One, done What did he say? Did you understand him, Harry? Now look, friends, friends, savvy friends. No, no friend. Quan Don Lee, White Devils. White Devils. That was us. They slashed off pieces of the vine ropes around the tree and twisted them about us so we could just move our legs. Then they pushed us ahead of them, through the gray daylight of the jungle, through the dim passages of winding lianas, the climbing tropical plants. Above a stray bird shot color through the overhanging trees. After about a mile, the path became a trail. The lianas were cut away. We tripped over some coconut husks by the side of a charred fire. We were coming into the village. Then Harry saw them first. Marco, look. Up there on the poles. Human heads. A row of skulls. Headhunters. Marco, these are headhunters. Move. Quan Dunley, move. Hey, look, Chief. Chief, you got it all wrong. Now, 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 we're not devils. We're friends. Friends. No. No. It's no use, Marco. American, you are right. It's no use. Colonel Sawaka. I am a great friend of these headhunters. For I warned them of your coming. Told them you are Quan Dunley. What? Devils who come to bring a plague and a pestilence to them. Uh, you it's right. no use. Chief, put the devils away. Then, Quan Dunley, Tal, Basha. They untied us and threw us in a straw thatched hut they called a Basha. Through the makeshift door, we could see the skulls on the poles. An endless row of them under the hot sun. And up the poles streamed columns of jungle ants, giving them an ancient burial. Uh, looks like the end of the line, Marco. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Harry. Uh, that chief speaks a little pidgin English. He understands a little. Do you think we could reason with him? Uh, it doesn't look like the reasonable type. Besides, our friend, Colonel Sawaka, got to him first. The tribe's convinced we're dangerous. Yeah. About as dangerous as a glass of buttermilk. A funny bucket. Yeah, that's Sawaka outside talking to the guard. Oh, no. We got company. I trust you are comfortable, Captain, Lieutenant. Why don't you climb a tree, a little monkey? Ow! Watch your tongue. <laughs> Was the most fortunate for me. I found a way here to a friendly camp. Sorry, I don't like your friends. <laughs> My friends do not like you either. Think you are devil Americans who bring evil to their people. 
Sleep well. Tomorrow you will join heads and poles. In the morning they brought us out. I guess we were pretty important because the big chief himself came over to tie us to the poles. Then I got an idea. I sneaked my hand in my pocket and grabbed a coin. Just held it tight. Come, Don Lee. Tie you now. Hey, chief. Look at this. What are you doing carrying dimes around in your ear? Uh. Well, what do you know? Another in your other ear. Uh, uh. And here's one in your nose. Toba. Say, you're a pretty sly character, aren't you? Regular walking bank of England. Hey, Marco, what are you up to? Just a couple of magic tricks if I can get away with them. I tell you, they love me in Sheboygan. Toba magic. That's right. Toba magic. Toba. Now, if you get me that knapsack you grabbed for me, I'll do more. See? Toba. Knapsack. Bag from back. Savvy? Remember, we'll do Toba. Do not listen to Juan Dali, but off ahead. Now, hey, now. Chief, look at this. Look at this. Now you see it? Now you don't. How about now? Presto, coins disappear. How about now? Get knapsack or you'll disappear. Savvy? Guncha plume by Kuna. Boy, that coin trick got him, and the Suwaka chief pushed Sawaka aside and sent one of his rover boys to get my knapsack. They brought it to me, and I took out the little box. I always knew it would come in handy sometime. Then the chief held up his hand again. And I went into my act. Brother, what an audience. And what a performance. Now watch closely, ladies and gentlemen. The hand is quicker than the eye. Resto changeo. I take this little glass of water, just an ordinary glass of water, if you will observe closely, and presto, it turns color. <laughs> You're doing great, devils. kid. What, what the, the shows? <laughs> I tell you, cut off the heads. Still. We still. You tell him, chief. The devils are devils. Go away, little man. You bother me. Now for the next bit of magic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I pulled every trick in the book out of that little box. Drew cigarettes from the chief's ear. Pulled flowers out of empty pots. Yanked a dozen colored scarves out of a single white handkerchief. And then I broke a stick in half and put it together again. Boy, did they love it. And now, for my final bit of hocus pocus, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Marco. Why don't what? you try saw a Sawaka in half and forget to put them together again? I got something better. Huh? As I was saying, the devils, these oh, American oh, devils, Cuba. Hey, Marco, he's you getting them over on this side. They're coming after us. Maybe this will stop them. Look, look, watch. Sign, sign from gods. Okay. Look. It stopped them all right. I pulled a bean blower out of the box, blew hard. And out came a tiny doll dressed in a Jap uniform. Without his head. And he floated to earth. The superstitious native stepped back, afraid to come any closer. See? See, sign! Japanese is Kwan Dan Lee. God say so! Americans, friends, friends! Doll there on the ground. Japanese doll. Sign from gods. Follow great white father and fight Japanese. Chief, you tell him. He told him, all right. The big trouble we had afterwards was keeping them from tearing Sawaka apart. We wanted him alive to take back to OSS headquarters in Bamo. Well... That's the story. The next day, the headhunters led us back through the jungle with our prisoner. <laughs> There's only one thing I'm sorry about. Too bad variety couldn't have caught my act. I tell you, they loved me in Burma. Captain Harry Stevens and Lieutenant John Marco safely delivered Colonel Sawaka to OSS headquarters in Bamo, where he gave valuable information on Japanese war industry and finance. And so, once again, 
the report of another OSS agent closes with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Starred in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Marco was Jerry Lester, with Larry Haynes as Harry, Colonel Suwaka, Daniel Ocko, Mrs. Terry, Irene Hubbard, the Colonel Raymond Edward Johnson. Others were Carl Weber, Arnold Robertson, and Jerry Jarrett. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of Murray Ross. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Louis G. Kahn production in association with Alfred Hollander as was under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS. Ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare. Espionage International Intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In today's adventure, the swastika on the windmill, the role of Paul Halfand, an OSS agent in Holland, is played by Les Tremaine. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. My mouth was as dry as ashes. The palms of my hands were wringing wet. My revolver was drawn, and I moved slowly, slowly along the dark hall. Everything I had been taught led up to this, this moment. Boards under my feet teetered. For a terrifying moment, I almost lost my balance and fell backwards. Something was ahead of me, in a room along that dark passage. I sensed it more than anything else. Then I heard it. I stopped breathing until I passed that room and the voices of the hidden Germans almost slid past them to the end of the corridor. There was a Nazi stormtrooper in uniform right in front of me, blocking the exit. Well, fire! Fire! Fire again! Good work, Paul. Well, that's it. You passed the test. Now the colonel wants to see you. What I had just come through was a cleverly designed scarehouse that rivaled any Coney Island chamber of horrors for one-a-minute thrills. This was part of the training of an OSS agent, and it took place less than an hour's ride from Washington, D.C. Lieutenant Howe found at the present time we have no information, and no way of getting information, on the disposition and plans of German troops in the Netherlands. We think they're up to something. We want to know what. Now, you'll be flown to England... And from there, a submarine will take you to the coast of Holland. The coast of Holland? To me, Holland was that little country where my Uncle Brom lived, where I visited when I was 12, where the windmills were now under the shadow of the swastika. I guess we can surface about here. There's Mac on Holland. Want to take a look, Lieutenant Halfen? Mm, Thanks, Commander Smurling. Through the periscope of the submarine tuna, I could see a windmill in the flat lowland of the Netherlands. I couldn't see the swastika, but I knew it was there. The pressure gauge showed 20 feet of salt water above us. Take her up. Take her up. Open the hatch. We climbed the ladder through the hatch where an inflated rubber boat was waiting to take me to shore. I'm only a couple of yards from shore. I can get out here. 
me that rucksack, please. Here you are, sir. Have you far to go from here? It's only about five miles from Makum to Bolsward, where my uncle lives. I can make it before the sun comes up. Goodbye. And thanks. Good luck. Good luck, sir. So when you rang the bell at San Paul, I jumped from my bed. The devil, I said. It's the Gestapo. <laughs> they finally put two and two together and connected me with the underground. Hush, Bram, hush. God gave you a tongue. Must you use it so loosely? I'm afraid my new Aunt Hilda doesn't trust me completely. I trust no one these days. Oh, Hilda, Hilda, this is Paul. <laughs> how often have I spoken to you of the times he came here when he was... <laughs> how old, Paul? Twelve, Uncle Brown. Ah, oh, yes, twelve. <laughs> and so proper, so correct. <laughs> A miniature model of propriety. <laughs> well, from the looks of it, you've grown, but you haven't changed much. Still proper as the devil. <laughs> <laughs> the result of my strict Quaker upbringing, Uncle Brown, remember? We were both taught never to drink or smoke or lie or or swear, Uncle Brom. Uh, yes. <clears throat> How long will you stay in Holland? Only long enough to contact the leader of the underground and get the information I'm after. I see. Tell me, why should we believe that you are an allied spy? Hilda! Answer me. Surely you don't expect me to carry proof about me that I'm a spy in case the Germans find me? Then how do we know? That's enough, Hilda. The devil, I say. I'll hear no more of this talk. All right, Brown. It will be as you say, and on your conscience. Your, your wife doesn't trust me. You were surprised, no doubt, to find your Aunt Katrina dead and... I remarried. Yes, yes, I was, Uncle Brom. I was lonesome. It's not good for a man to live by himself. And she is a good woman. But she doesn't trust me. She has her reasons. There was a man in these parts not long ago. He passed himself off as a British agent, gained the confidence of some of the underground. Then he turned them over to the Gestapo. Oh, I see. Hilda's family was among those executed. You understand now? Uncle Brom, you haven't seen me nor heard from me since I was a boy. You don't know where I've been during those years in between. You don't know what my loyalties are. Do you trust me? Tomorrow I will take steps to put you in contact with Hans Bock in Luaden, the leader of the Dutch underground. When I awoke a few hours later, it was about ten o'clock. Through the window of the spare room that Aunt Hilda had made up for me, I could see the neat little milk carts jolting over the Keistin and the cobblestones. And I could see the endless stream of bicycles. And here and there, a German soldier in uniform, like a blot on the landscape. I'm afraid the breakfast is not as sumptuous as it was in the old days, Paul. Do not apologize for what we cannot change. Um, Aunt Hilda is right. It was very good. The Roger Brood was just as I remembered it. And these current buns, these Crenton Brood, just, uh, they're wonderful. Hmm. I will leave you. I have a house to clean. You're still suspicious of me? Have I any reason not to be? Hilda, enough! Paul is my sister's son. I will stake my own life's blood that he is to be trusted. Let us hope you do not have to. Hilda! Aunt Hilda. Look. This pistol. I'm giving it to you. It's the only one I have. The only one you have? And you give it to me? Yeah. I put myself at your mercy. If at any time you have proof, even the slightest, that I'm not what I claim to be, take my own gun and turn it on me. I will take your gun and take you at your word. That should convince her, Paul, you are what you say. Mm, I hope so. Now, what about this Hans Buck? 
How can I get in touch with him? I will arrange for a meeting between you halfway at the Harlingen, uh, five days from now, to give him time to collect the information you are after. <laughs> The days until Thursday, when I was supposed to meet Hans Buck, passed slowly, but they weren't wasted. I set up the shortwave radio in the wine cellarette in the living room. I had long talks with Uncle Brum, and I went out of my way to win over Aunt Hilda. Are you sure there's nothing I can do to help you with dinner, Aunt Hilda? Nothing. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's, it's still raining. One need not be too clever to see that. Eh? In Holland, it seems always to be raining now. Rain, mud, and despair. I remember when I came here years ago. It was winter. I was in time for the skaters' races. Yeah. Skaters' races. And the booths. Remember the little booths that sold chocolate and milk cooked with aniseed? And the little cakes, all the varieties of gingerbread? Oh, how I loved them. Hand me the spoon. Uh, Here. Here you are. Thank you. Tell me about America. What is it like? Well, it's too large to describe in a sentence or two, Aunt Hilda. When the war is over, you must come visit us. Hmm. When the war is over. (sighs) Well, it it can't last forever. And America is helping. And remember, our leader, President Roosevelt, is himself of Dutch ancestry. Tomorrow... Tomorrow, perhaps, I will make you a gingerbread cake. Yes, I won her over slowly. And on Thursday, when I left for Harlingen, she said goodbye to me at the door with Uncle Brown. You know where to meet him, Paul. You have everything clear? Yeah, everything, Uncle Brown. I'm to meet him beside the monument of the stone man on the North Sea dikes. I'll be knotting and unknotting a piece of string so he'll know me. Good, good. We will uh, see you later tonight, then? Yeah. Paul? Here. This is for you. In case you should have need of it. My pistol. Take it back. Thank you. Thank you, Aunt Hilda. Good morning. Good morning. This habit you have of knotting and unknotting string, is it not a waste of time? Nothing is a waste if it serves a purpose. Herr Buck? Yeah, Lieutenant Alfond. We meet this plan. The information. Do you have it? Yeah. Where? Where? In my head. You'll have to memorize it as I give it to you. I could not take a chance of writing anything down. I'll remember then. Remember it and use it well. There are 40,000 Nazi troops in Holland and Belgium. These troops will be on the move within two weeks. Where are they going? Northern Italy. They will be used to cut off the American advance there. The colonel did suspect the worst. Thank you. Thank you. I'll radio this out tonight. It is appropriate, is it not, for us to meet under the statue of this stone man? Hmm. See the inscription? Uh, Terminus. It means thus far and no farther. A threat to the sea that is held back by the dikes. Thus far and no farther. A threat also to the Nazis? Yeah. You understand me well. Remember me to your uncle, and goodbye for now. Herr Bock is in constant danger of discovery by the Gestapo, Paul. 
That's why he could not take a chance and write that information down for you. It wasn't necessary, Uncle Brown. He passed it from his head to mine. When will you radio it to London? It's after midnight. I think I can start now. What's that? The car stopping in front of the house. There are two men getting out. So late? Who are they, Brown? Do you know them? No, I don't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid it was like this once before when I came to get my family. Uh, Paul? We were turned in then by someone who pretended to be a friend. Hilda. Aunt Hilda, do you believe I don't know. I... I don't know what to believe. I'll answer it. Mr. Kelderman. Yeah? We have business with you. Come in. This is my wife and my nephew, Paul Halfond. Your nephew? <laughs> Max, take a good look at him. Huh? Would you say he looks as if he's to be trusted? I never trust the man who looks so innocent. What are you talking about? Who are you? Do not be so suspicious. We are from Hans Bock. We are members of the underground. Underground? I was not conscious there was an underground in the Netherlands. What do you want with us? Ah, you're being very careful. I can see that, Herr Kelderman, and that's good. And perhaps this will prove who we are. Would you not say that is Herr Bock's own signature? Yeah, that is his all right. Mm -hmm. I know it well. You're convinced now. Read it aloud, Uncle Brown. Let me read it, Paul. Have reason to distrust man you sent me today. Show proof who he is or turn him over to these men for underground execution. But this is ridiculous. I do not understand. Nor I. Herr Bock seemed to trust me well enough this afternoon. Your nephew is a German spy, a traitor in our midst. The devil he is. I do not believe that. Not Paul. He's not a spy. Not for the Germans. You want proof? I will give you proof. Uh, see here, in the wine cellar. Uh, this is his shortwave radio. He was going to send a message tonight. He is a friend. He is an ally. He is a member of the American OSS. Uh, don't you believe me? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> what is the matter? We believe you well enough. Thank you for giving us proof of what we suspected. What's this? Shall I show them my badge, Herr Commander? Do that, Sergeant. Do that. Take a good look. The skull and crossbones. The Gestapo. We've been trailing Herr Bock, but we had no definite proof that he was connected with the underground. We only suspected. And today we saw him meet your... Nephew here on the North Sea dikes. Why did you wait until we now? We figured that if we arrested them then and there, we might get nothing from them. So we waited. We arrested Herr Bock, and we found a paper with his signature on it. That note you showed us was forged. Quite right, Frau Kelterman. The note was forged. Herr little Bock by little. Tell us anything. Inch by now inch. Can no longer I have made my way to the yet. kitchen door. You have killed him. Right again. And, and then around the corner. Obliged to your husband for supplying us and up the, the back stairs. The commander, he escaped. After him. Halt! Run, Paul! The attic! Halt! I will go west with you! In a flood of memory, it came back. Chamber of horrors, an hour's drive from Washington. My mouth was dry as ashes, but the palms of my hands were wringing wet. Along the dark hall, my revolver drawn. Everything I had been taught led up to this. This moment. We have you covered from both sides. Drop your gun! Well, fire! Fire! Fire again! Into the darkness! But this time there was no instructor to say good work, Paul. There was just a gun in my back and a leader of the Gestapo to say... You are under arrest, Lieutenant Harlfond. <laughs> How long do you think you can hold out? We have ways of making you talk. No, no. <laughs> Must we convince you more? Sergeant. Yeah, Herr Commando. Yeah. Well? Eh, perhaps we'll have better luck if we question your aunt. Sergeant, get Frau Kelderman. Bring her here. No, no, no. Don't do that. Let her alone. Simply because you request it? Sergeant, do as I say. We'll see how long she holds out. If she is obstinate, we'll have a shot. And you will be a witness, Lieutenant. <laughs> you find this amusing, Lieutenant Hyphon? <laughs> well, I know when I'm beaten. Don't bother the old lady or the old man either. 
What are you saying? Well, I, I thought I could hold out. I can see now there's no point in holding out. You've won. What more is there to say? If you're just stalling for time... I'm not stalling, Herr Commander. I'll prove it. I'll confess everything. Tell you everything you want to know. Now you're becoming smart. And so I told them everything they wanted to know. General Donovan heads the OSS in Washington. The OSS is part of the American State Department. The Minister of Finance in Britain is also head of the British Secret Intelligence. Go ahead, Lieutenant Harfond. We're listening. Corporal, take this down. I gave them a mixture of fact and fantasy that would have done the German propaganda ministry proud. The true facts I told them I knew they already knew. The rest they seemed to accept at face value. So I kept my story with a real whopper. You taking all this down, Corporal? We'll take this down with a red pencil. An invasion of North Holland is part of the Allied plan. What? The invasion will be made in the eastern area of Friesland on the Dutch North Sea coast. You are lying to us, you... <clears throat> we'll see if you know you are beaten. <laughs> Perhaps you've been on the wrong side, Lieutenant Hartford. You've uh, set up a radio? I think you ought to use it. Tonight. <laughs> is now 2300. 2300. Paul Halfond calling headquarters. Can you hear me? Over. OSS headquarters to Paul Halfond. You're coming in clear. I've been waiting for your message, Paul. Good to hear your voice. What Over. did you say? There's a gun in your back. <laughs> I can see it's going to take a lot to convince you. Paul Halfond to headquarters. Listen. Listen carefully. It's stinking weather for a drop, but I've got to have supplies. It's darned important. Over. Headquarters to Halfon. Would you mind repeating that so we're sure? Repeat, please. Over. What the devil's the matter? You said you were getting darn good reception. I said the weather's lousy, but it's darned important that I get a supply drop at designated point tomorrow night. Can't make it any darn clearer than that. Over. Okay. Okay, Paul. We get it. It's darn clear now. You'll get your supply drop. Good night. Over and out. Well, you heard it yourself. The drop will be made. Are you beginning to be convinced of my sincerity? Were you nervous, Lieutenant? What? Why do you say that? I never heard you use such language before. Oh, I... Uh, I expect to get over my nervousness after I broadcast many of these radio messages for you, Commander Brandt. After that, they drove me back to the jail. Commander Brandt of the Gestapo had never heard me use such language before, and neither had OSS headquarters. <laughs> In the army, they used to make fun of me because of my proper speech. I gambled on the chance that the radio operator who knew me would detect something odd about my speech. When he answered back the same way, I knew he understood I was a prisoner of the Germans, and that the supply drop would probably save my neck. I didn't sleep that night, and I didn't really take a deep breath until 11 o'clock the next morning. Good morning, Lieutenant. Would you care, perhaps, for a piece of chocolate or an American cigarette? <laughs> I knew the drop had been successful. They sent us home. Uncle Brom, Aunt Hilda, and me. But we brought a boarder with us in the person of Commander Brandt. House was different now. Aunt Hilda prepared meals silently. Uncle Brom smoked his pipe and looked at me, wondering. And twice a week they sat in the living room and watched and listened as Commander Brandt and I contacted OSS headquarters. OSS headquarters to Paul Halpin. This is important. Four and twenty blackbirds are coming through the Rhine. Storm clouds overhead. Take in your washing. Good night. Over and out. Huh. What did that mean? Fifteen thousand more Allied troops are added to preparations for the invasion of Holland. <laughs> well, 
and we will rush 20,000 more German troops to the Dutch North Sea coast. Already we have 40,000 troops waiting there. We were going to send them to... Uh, else, well... But they will undoubtedly be of more use here. Undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, I'm going up to bed now. Dog shit. The dinner was very good, Frau Kelderman. I cannot help being a good cook. <laughs> yes, well... Good night. It's thoughtful of him to leave us alone so much. Is it? I do not care much for your company. Hilda, maybe he's got his reasons. I wanted to tell them my reasons, but I didn't dare. Instead, I stood at the piano and played the scale with one finger. Even Uncle Brom was getting to the point where he couldn't look me straight in the eye. But as Uncle Brom became more suspicious, Commander Brandt became less suspicious. I think I will go up to bed, too. Something was wrong with the piano. The sea was sharp, as if something were pressing on it, making it sharp. I walked around to the back of the baby grand, and I saw it. It was a small round disc the size of an overcoat button. I knew it was attached to a dictaphone in Brandt's room. That was why he left us alone so much. I'd give him something to listen to. Paul, I know there must be some explanations for these things you are doing. Now look, you haven't had it so good for years. Eggs on the table. When did you have eggs on the table last? Privileges nobody else has. Extra ration books. You might as well face it. This is a new order, Germany's order. And if you're smart like I am, you'll fall in with them. Paul, Paul, is this you? I told you he was a traitor, a spy. I warned you. You wanted to see me, Herr Commander? Yeah, Paul. Uh, thank you for coming to my office so promptly at my call. I follow orders. So I'm beginning to see. Uh, sit down, sit down. I want you to hear something. I think I'll go up to bed, well, too. I don't understand. Super. A dictaphone. But I still oh, don't... I know there must be some what? explanation. That's Uncle Brum. Yeah. Now, look... You haven't had it so good for years. That's me. Eggs on yeah. the table. Well, what's the idea of doing it on the table last? Privileges nobody else has. Extra ration books. You might as well face it. This is a new order. Germany. You have order. convinced me completely. If you're smart like I am, you will fall in with them. I have a proposition for you. Yes? I want you to go to England for us. Act as a double agent. You can be more valuable to us there. Leave Holland? Yeah. But aren't I a great help to you here? I know the risk it involves. But Germany would pay you well after the war. Take it over. I thought it over and let him convince me. And a few days later, a German stormtrooper gave me a personal escort to the border. And I made my way back from the enemy lines. After I left... My aunt and uncle escaped and were hidden by the underground. And it wasn't until the war was over that I was able to see them and explain. Lieutenant Paul Halfen returned to OSS headquarters. And thousands of Nazi troops waited on the shore of the North Sea for an invasion that never came. Thus, once again, the report of another OSS agent closed with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Paul Halfond was Les Tremaine. Brahm was played by Stefan Schnabel, Hilda by Virginia Payne, Bant by Barry Kroger, the Colonel by Raymond Edward Johnson. 
Others were Carl Weber, Jerry Jarrett, Arnold Robertson, and Bob Wilde. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of Murray Ross. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander and was under the direction of Sherman Marks. Programs, get your programs here. Mystery fans, there's an exciting evening waiting for you tonight on NBC. First, some listener will have a chance to win a double reward for solving the case on $1,000 reward. Next, when a woman reads her own obituary in the paper, the saint finds himself involved in a case that leads to murder. Then Sam Spade works his way through the rod and reel caper. Yes, you'll find adventure here tonight. Stay tuned now for High Adventure and the Big Guy on NBC. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare, Espionage International Intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, recommendation from Rummel, about an American OSS agent in Italy who almost outsmarted himself is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. Hey! Come back here! You can't leave me here! I demand to see someone in authority! Let me out of here! Brother, that was some spot to be in. Me, Joe Donato, in a jail cell in Milan, Italy. It was crazy. Well, after a while, I got tired of yelling. So I sat down on a narrow prison cot and thought back to the way it had begun. On a train from Varese to Milan, the French underground had smuggled me from Lyon across Switzerland, and I made my way over the border. From there on, I was on my own posing as an Italian chocolate salesman. So I sat back in my compartment, lit a European cigarette and blew smoke rings over my head to the rack, where my shortwave radio was hidden in one of the suitcases. All of a sudden, the train gave a lurch. One of my suitcases took a flying dive to the floor. It was a suitcase with a penknife scar across the leather handle, the one with the radio. I was glad I was alone in that compartment. I couldn't wait to find out if that radio was all right. You see, the case was lined with a false backing of boxes of chocolates to hide the radio. I unfastened the backing, and there was the radio. It was okay. Nothing was broken. And then before I could refasten the backing, I heard voices outside the compartment door. I didn't have time to refasten the backing. I had just enough time to slam the case shut again, slide it back up in the rack, and get back in my seat. Major, what is this? I was under the impression this compartment was reserved for me alone. There must be some mistake, Hairfield Marshal. There was a mistake, all right. My mistake in picking the one compartment on the train that had been chosen for Field Marshal Rommel. Dumko, what is the meaning of this? I do not know, Senor Major. That has been a mistake, a grave mistake. Do not tell me of mistakes. This is your stupidity. You had your orders. Oh, no, no, I instructed the train guard very carefully. Be still. I will not have this disturbance, you understand? Uh, yes, Your Excellency. I, uh, I am sorry if I have been the cause of this. I... Uh, I assure you it was quite unintentional. I will take my suitcases and leave immediately. I see, see, bah, it is best. You live. I will find you another compartment. Oh, no, wait. Yeah. It's unnecessary, Conductor. The gentleman is already here. There's room for both of us. We Germans and Italians must share. Is it not so? Oh, I, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you would uh, prefer your privacy. It, uh, <laughs> it is nothing for me to move. No, I will not hear of it. Sit where you are. 
Actually, I would welcome company. I detest train rides. Major, yes, arrange Excellency. a table for me in the dining car. Yes, Your Excellency. You are stupid, conductor. Next time, pay attention to orders. I do not know how this happens. Such a fuss over nothing. Tell me your name. Oh, my name is Donato, Giuseppe Donato, Your Excellency. Hmm. Where are you headed for, Signor Donato? Oh, I am getting off at Milano. Oh, I see. Well, we shall have time to get acquainted. Be at your ease. Time to get acquainted. Great. What are we going to talk about? Maybe I could get the conversation started by saying, Herr Field Marshal Rommel, yes. it might interest you to know that I am an OSS spy. I am in Italy to radio back information on your northern supply concentrations. You say you are a chocolate salesman? Uh, see, si. my office is in Verona. Uh, here is my card. <laughs> well, I'm not in the market for chocolate. You may put the card back. Oh, here. You drop this. Your medical classification in the fascist army? Uh, grazie. That uh, was a great disappointment to me, Your Excellency, oh, but yes. uh, you see, an old back injury kept me out of the army. You must not blame yourself for something you cannot help. Still, it is a great disappointment. Yes, I understand. Your Excellency. Yes, Major. Your table in the dining room, it is ready. Ah, yeah. Marker. I will return soon, Signor Donato. We will continue our conversation. We had talked ten minutes, and I aged ten years. I wondered if I should change compartments before he came back. No, 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 that might seem suspicious. I looked out of the window. The green rolling hills of citrus and olive trees didn't tell me anything. I just crossed my fingers and hoped we were coming into Milan soon. You, Donato. Uh, see, uh, what do you want with me? I do not want anything with you. The field marshal wants to see you, and you'd better be quick about it. Oh, see. No, see. no, leave your suitcases. Just come with me, quickly. <laughs> You, uh, wanted to see me, Your Excellency? Yes. Sit down. There, opposite me. Oh, grazie, grazie. I thought about you after I left the compartment, Signor Donato. Si? Si. <laughs> would you care to join me for coffee, Signor? It would be my pleasure. Coffee with Field Marshal Rommel. <laughs> Wait till I tell the gang back home about this, I thought. There was a man across the aisle. A dapper little guy with a waxed mustache. He and Rommel nodded to each other. And then the dapper little old guy kept watching me. Watching me. Yeah. I never can get used to this Italian coffee with all its chicory. I don't suppose I ever will. I would naturally have a fondness for it. I have had it all my life. <laughs> Where was your home originally? Uh, in Urbino. Oh, the birthplace of Raphael. My family is still living there. Yeah. Would you like to see some snapshots, Your oh, Excellency? Yes, <laughs> I would very much. They are right here in my wallet. Ah, I hear you. See uh, that uh, little farm in the valley? Oh, it, it yes. is here. You see? Ah, ah. Oh, this is a huge generation. Uh, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the pretty child. Oh, who is she? Oh, uh, my sister Francesca. She looks very much like you, yeah. <laughs> it was interesting very that uh, Rommel thought the kid in the picture looked very like me. Like you the this snapshots had been made by OSS That's photographers, really and an early picture oh. of me had been superimposed oh, over very, the negative. Very attractive family group. You know, Signor Donato, I've taken quite a fancy to you. Oh, <laughs> Uh, tell me, uh, these, uh, these chocolates you sell, uh, are they any good? Oh, see, si, see, si, they're very good. Oh, not, uh, not, uh, as arts. Oh, no, 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 no. no? Uh, well, uh, surely well, one or two of them could not be missed, huh? I is it all right with you if I send my adjutant to get one of the suitcases? Yes? Uh, we Germans and Italians must share. Uh, no, no. I, 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 you, oh, it's, it's perfectly all right. O only uh, I, I will get them myself. Oh, for no, you. no. I want There's no need. Major, yes, uh, yes. go to the compartment and bring one of the signors. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, it is foolish to send him. Signor. I can easily go myself. You no, see. no. I insist. We will have so little time for 
talking before the train stops at Milano. I had no choice. I had to sit there and sweat it out. Just pray that the adjutant brought back the right case. I felt as if there were a band of steel around my head that kept getting tighter and tighter. What is it, my friend? Are you not feeling well? Oh, it is uh, very hot in here, is it not? Oh, uh, yes, it is, unfortunately, yes. Perhaps I should call the conductor and have it. Oh, here, the Major returns with your sample case. The first thing I looked at when the Major put the case in my lap was the handle. There was a long scar in the leather. It was the one with the radio. <laughs> you know, I've always had a fondness for chocolates. <laughs> well, come, open it. Well? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the catch, it, uh, it, it seems to be stuck. <laughs> well, surely you can fix it. Oh, see, si, see, si, of course, uh, that is... Uh, I will try. Give it to me. Yeah, what, what? I have an excellent little pen knot. Perhaps I can adjust the lock. No, 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 no. I, I, I will get it in a moment. I, I'm no, sure. I, I will. Can do Milano. It. This station is Milano. Oh, Milano. Uh, th that is my stop, Your Excellency. Oh, so soon. What a pity. Uh, well, if uh, if you wish, I, I will stay on till the next station. Open oh, this no. for you. Take a bus back. No, 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 no. I would not think of it. It is too kind of you to suggest it. But we must say, I'll be the same. Arrivederle, Field Marshal Rommel. It has been a great honor. I hurried back to the compartment to get my coat and hat. And then on an impulse, I grabbed the other case off the rack. And as the train stopped, I turned and ran back toward the dining room. Senor! Senor! This is Milano. I know, I know. I'm getting off in a minute. Un momento. Uh, here, Field Marshal. Senor Donato, I did not expect to see you back. Uh, Your Excellency, if you will permit me, uh, here is this this case of chocolates. Oh, for you, oh, Senor. You see, no. the, the, the lock works oh, now. Thank you. Uh, uh, grazie. Molte grazie. If I pass through Milano, I will look you up. I don't know where I'll be staying, sir. It is not difficult for the police to find the man. I'll be the same. <laughs> And with this pleasant thought, I left him. Glad to get off that train. You don't need OSS training to tell you when someone's following you. It's an instinctive feeling you get. I started to walk a little faster. And the footsteps behind me quickened too. I passed a small coffee shop and through the reflection in the window I could see coming after me the man in the dining car who had never taken his eyes off me. The dapper little guy with the mustache. He and Rommel had nodded to each other. Was it a signal? Did Rommel just try to string me along? I broke into a run. Senor, stop! I didn't intend to stop until I got wait, past that gate. Then maybe I could lose him in the crowd. I said, wait! Wait! To stop him is somebody! Elba! God, what are you doing? Open that gate! I am sorry, senor. This gate is closed. Now use the south but, gate. But, but I can't... I, I am sorry. This gate is closed. Senor! Senor! I've had such trouble catching up with you. Uh, who, who are you? Allow me. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the Count Pietro Imperiale. What do you want with me? Well, I noticed you were having coffee on the train with Field Marshal Rommel himself. I'm a great admirer of the Marshal, and I have a nodding acquaintance with him. Oh, see, eh... Uh... What has that to do with me? Well, I happen to know, senor, that Rommel does not make friends easily, and so when I saw you two together, I... Well, amico, would you do me the extreme honor of joining me at my palace for dinner this evening? It would be a great pleasure to entertain a good friend of Rommel's. <laughs> As the long black limousine drove up to the palace, I felt like a visitor of the Middle Ages. The gray stone steps were hollowed with age. This way, senor. The lower windows were blazing with light. And two torches set in brackets flanked the doors. <laughs> <laughs> quiet, Bobo, quiet, quiet. 
The floors were made of colored marble. On the walls hung ancient tapestries with scenes from the Old Testament. I walked through, past a lot of servants. My mouth was open at all this grandeur. And I walked right into a suit of armor. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Come, amico mio. Dinner is waiting. Ah, that uh, was a delicious dinner. Grazie, Cant Imperiale. Molto bene, molto bene. I'm delighted you enjoyed it. Now, we will sit here in the library and uh, talk of Rommel. Cigaro? Eh, grazie, no. Tell me, what was he like? What uh, did he say? Oh, we merely exchanged pleasantries. Uh -huh. Great leader, great chief. Once when he was in Milan, I, I planned a reception talk for and him. kept looking but around the huge library. He was unable to attend. What a set of that basketball games. However, well, <sighs> this was being introduced Would to Milan in a royal way. Uh, what was that? A little brandy? Oh, no, no, brandy. <laughs> what is it, Bobo? What's the matter? Good evening, Count Imperiale. They told me you were here. Uh, you see, Bobo, it is only Antonia. Come, come, my dear. I would, uh, I would like you to uh, meet a friend. See, si. Signor Giuseppe Donato, great friend of Rommel's. My, I am impressed. Piacere. The pleasure is mine. <laughs> <laughs> che bella questa ragazza, no? My secretary is very pretty, non è vero? Your lordship, there is a call on your private phone in a small library. Oh, see. Si. I will return. It will give you two a chance to uh, get acquainted, huh? Quiet, Bobo. <clears throat> è molto bella, signorina. You are very pretty. Count Imperiale was right. <laughs> Did you find yourself forced into that compliment, signor? Oh, no, 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 not at all. We Italians are proud of our beautiful women, and it is impossible not to notice how well you represent them. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you live? In Milano? Uh, no, 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 I'm here uh, on business. <laughs> Where are you staying? Oh, I only arrived today. I've made no plans yet. Uh, you uh, are the Count's secretary? His personal secretary. Since the Count has passed on, I attend to all arrangements for his banquets and receptions, as well as his personal correspondence. Oh, oh, I see. He is un grand signor. I am very fond of him. <laughs> I remember how disappointed he was when Field Marshal Rommel... Failed to attend a reception he planned for him. Oh, I, I know. He, he told me that. He uh, is a great admirer of Rommel. So am I. Tell me about him, Signor. Does he intend to come to Milano soon? Uh, perhaps we can plan something else in his honor. I uh, don't know his intentions. <laughs> perhaps he is returning to Africa immediately. I uh, don't know that either. Yeah. Well... I see you two have become acquainted, huh? Molto bene. Your Lordship, since the signor is staying in Milano, shall I give him the name of a good hotel? Hotel? With 40 rooms here, most of them empty? I should say not. You will stay here, amico mio, as long as you want. Grazie. Molto gentile. I'm very grateful. They gave me a suite to myself with a tremendous canopied bed and a sculptured rug on the floor. Through the casement window, I could see the Piazza Sundial, the narrow streets of Milan, and off in the distance, the church of Santa Maria della Grazia. Who was going to look for an American spy in a setup like that, hmm? Who's made to order? Every night, I patted the radio in the suitcase and hoped I'd have a message to send back soon. A few days later, Count Imperiale asked me to walk to his office with him. Ah, this Italian summer makes me feel ten years younger. 
You know, if I were 20 years younger, I would be more attentive to that dark-eyed secretary of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she seems to have taken an interest in you. Oh, that's so? She is, you see. She's a keep on to ask questions about you. Oh, see, you still have not told me why you want to see me at your office. I uh, refuse to speak business at home. Never do. And uh, your business? I, I don't know that either. You will. Soon enough. Come. My office is in the municipal building across the square. I followed him across the square. Over the fat pink cobblestones. Everywhere around me were black-shirted fascisti. I wondered if my good luck so far had made me too sure of myself. I followed him up the stairs to the municipal building. Down the narrow corridor. And we stopped at a door third from the end. And then I know what his business was. Superintendent of Police. Brego, I beg of you. Please, go in. Count Imperiale, I, I don't understand. Now you know my business. I am superintendent of police. Often an unpleasant occupation. Come in. I said come in. That's right. I uh, wanted to see you here because it's necessary for us to have a little talk about you and the police. What? Have I to do with the police? How would you like to work for me? Now, come, come, come. Don't look so startled. Work for you? Uh, as a member of the police? Yeah, but of course. Perhaps this communication from Rommel will explain. Grazie. As you can see, it's a request from him for me to locate you in Milano and offer you this position. He's obviously very fond of you. Great Chief Rommel, and he knows how badly you feel about your medical classification in the army. Ah, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. Well, <laughs> just to say you accept. Ordinarily, of course, I would have to make extensive research into your background before offering you this position, but uh, <laughs> a personal recommendation from Rommel hardly makes that necessary. But what do you say, amico mio? <laughs> What do you think I said? I said yes in a hurry. And when I left the office later, I had a badge in everything. Ever since I boarded the train at Varese, I had one bad scare after another. But so far, nothing had happened. I was beginning to feel I led a charmed life. Until I got back to my suite at the palace. Riot, Bobo. Antonia! What are you doing with that suitcase? These are excellent chocolates. Will you have one? What right have you in here? I was curious about you. I found out I had reason to be curious. I'd like you to meet two friends, Giacomo and Mario. For the first time I saw them, two men standing half hidden in the shadows of the big room. And on the chair before Antonia was my suitcase. She turned it around so I could see the inside. The backing was off. The radio was gone. Who are these men? What is this? No, no, Paura. Do not be afraid. Antonia was right when she said we were friends. But this uh, was a foolhardy place to leave your radio, Americano. I found a better hiding place in the wall safe of an unused room in the palace. <laughs> it is all right, Signor Donato. We are partisans, members of the underground. You just, uh, you just stand there and tell me this? Why not? Your American radio has given us proof of who you are. No doubt you want proof of who we are. Escort her. I'm listening. We will tell you all that you came here to find out. All you have to do is to ask and we will answer. We will answer even before you ask. The Nazis are using northern Italy as a supply base for the Africa Corps. In fact, Rommel is expecting air reinforcements to leave here at the end of the week. How many planes? Seventy-five bombers. Where are they? In a field at Caravaggio, ten miles west. You, uh, you emptied my valise. There, uh, was an altitude bomb there. Did you find it? Is is this what you mean? Yes. Is there anyone in the underground who can duplicate it? <laughs> the professor of chemistry in the University of Milano is a, a friend. What? You see, if you remove the pin from these bombs and plant them in an airplane, they'll explode automatically when the ship gains altitude. We will let you know when you can see the fireworks. Oh, oh, and uh, another bit of information. See, si. It uh, 
might interest you to know that uh, you have been talking to a member of the fascisti secret police. <laughs> Ah, Antonia, you look more lovely than ever this evening. Buona tarda, my lord. And grazie. And you, amico, where are you going? Uh, for a drive, sir. <laughs> mm, how wonderful it must be to be young again, especially in the summer. Well, go and enjoy yourselves. Oh, we will. We are sure we will. <laughs> It is fortunate the Count did not invite himself along. You're sure we can see everything from this hilltop? Very sure. When the planes take off from Caravaggio, after midnight, we will see them. It, uh, it's cool up here on this hill. Not cool enough to offer you an excuse to put your arm around me. Oh, you remember what the Count said. We are young. It is summer. Senor, this is business. Scotta. Listen. The planes. They are taking off. Any minute now. Any minute. What if something happened? What if they weren't able to plant those bombs? What if they... Oh. What if, eh? <laughs> Although this seems a poor way to repay Rommel for his hospitality. Rommel didn't get his 75 Luftwaffe bombers. No sky protection, and that played a part when he was thrown back from El Alamein a short month later. The OSS continued to get total information on northern Italy, supply concentrations, troop movements, and underground activities. Each time police triangulation detected my radio antenna, I, as a member of the secret police, would lead a raid. Having first, as a member of the underground, moved it to another spot. And then one day, the Americans took over Milan. I walked into G2 headquarters to give them a personal welcome. What do you mean, just walking into my office like this? Sergeant, who is this guy? Sorry, Major, I couldn't stop him. By the black shirt he's wearing, whoever he is, I don't like him. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you, you boys got me wrong. What I came to What's tell you... What's your name? Uh, Donato. Lieutenant Giuseppe... Uh, uh, Joe Donato. Uh, look, you don't understand. I'm a member of the OSS. Yeah, sure, he's a member. Look, Mac, that's enough, Sergeant. Donato, according to our list, you're a high-ranking member of the fascisti police. Thanks for giving yourself up. I'm not giving myself up. That's what you think, Mac. I tell you, I'm a member of the OSS. We have your full record, Donato. In his own reports to fascisti headquarters, Count Imperiali thought very highly of you. I don't care what he thought. And in the files, we found a personal recommendation from Rommel about you. <laughs> a personal recommendation from Rommel, and you expect us to believe... You're a member of the OSS? But you, you... Take him away, Sergeant. Throw him in jail. You can't do this now to I me! I'll writing. write to my congressman! Hey, come back! I demand to see someone in authority! Let me out of here! I stand on my constitutional rights! Let me out of here! Shut up! A week later, OSS in London sent verification on Lieutenant Joseph Donato, and an embarrassed G2 headquarters released him from jail. Thus, once again, the report of another agent closed with the words, Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure is Joe as Ralph Bell, Rommel, Barry Kroger, the Count, Arnold Moss, Antonia, Jan Minor, the Colonel, Raymond Edward Johnson. Others were Boris Applin, Jerry Jarrett, and Carl Weber. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of John Garth. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program is directed by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander, under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. 
Programs, get your programs here. Action and adventure are yours tonight. $1,000 reward offers a mystery for you to solve at home for a $3,000 cash prize, followed by the corpse said, ouch, tonight's case on the saint, and then Sam Spade solves another exciting caper, searching for the bell King Solomon used to call his wives. That's tonight on NBC. Now stay tuned for High Adventure and the Big Guy on NBC. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare. Espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, The Roof of the World, concerning two American agents who travel into the far-off and mysterious land of Tibet on a secret pilgrimage, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. It came at us suddenly, out of the darkness. A shaggy monster over 15 feet high. None of us said a word for a minute. We just stared at it. The tusks. Look at the length of them. The tusks of this monster must have been at least 12 feet long. And I knew myself that if I hadn't seen it, stood right in front of it, I wouldn't have believed it actually existed either. But I saw it. There was definite proof. It did live. Once. Okay, okay, lights. Put on the lights, please. All right now, quiet please, quiet. What you have just seen is the last of our afternoon slides here in the Museum of Natural History on prehistoric animals. This last mammoth was a species of a true elephant which was found in Tibet during and before the Ice Age. Now, are there any questions? Yeah, how do you get out of here? (laughs) Well, if you'll all follow the guide, he'll take you into the next room where you can actually see the skeletons of these monsters, which paleontologists have reconstructed from fossils and actual bones discovered in the earth. Philip? Oh, Phil. Oh, hello, Esther. Were you here for the whole lecture? No, just the last part of it. But you were sensational. (laughs) Flattery will get you nowhere. Uh, What's that? Oh, telegram. Here, just came to the office. Thanks. No, it's not for me, it's for us. Oh, who's it from? Washington. The Office of Strategic Services wants to see us. Office of Strategic... Now, why in the world do they want us? Well, there's one way to find out. Mr. and Mrs. Malden, we know your reputation as geologists and explorers... We know you traveled the Far East together several times. That's true, Colonel. Now, at this stage of the war, Germany is pushing eastward across Africa to Suez, and Japan is thrusting westward across China into India. If the Axis partners meet, their junction will be Central Asia, and dominating that meeting point will be Tibet. What do you want us to do, Colonel? We want volunteers to make a pilgrimage to the Dalai Lama, high priest of Tibet, It'll be a goodwill mission to get them on our side. It involves a great deal of danger. Yes, yes, we know. Esther? (laughs) Well, as long as you're sure that mammoth elephant disappeared from there centuries ago, I'm willing. A few weeks later, we were flown to India where we were given a car. Then the two of us started out across the border to a village called Gyuksan, at the foot of the Himalaya Mountains. Once there, we were to pick up pack animals and a guide and start our journey to the holy city. These roads couldn't have been any narrower or any rockier. Well, they weren't designed for modern travel. You can say that again. Phil. Hmm? Are you worried about something? I'm worried about a lot of things. For instance? For instance, this is the worst possible time of the year to be traveling up that mountain. 
It's almost spring up there, and the thaw is setting in. It's going to loosen the snow and ice all along the way. Well, we'll just have to be more careful, that's all. Hmm. Oh, Phil, look, round the bend of the road. That's the village, isn't it? That's it. That's it. Wait a minute, Phil. Slow down. Look. Good Lord. I should have said it was a village. Burned to the ground. The old man who sat wailing and moaning, cross-legged on the ground, was the only one left alive in that village. Bandy tribe come from mountains, steal, kill, set fire to village. How is it they spared you? I am priest sent from Dalai Lama to this village many years past. If they kill hoary man, great prig and pestilence will be upon them. Well, tell me, where'd you learn to speak English? In hoary city was taught. Well, what do we do now, Phil? We can't leave him here alone. We'll take him with us and drive until we find another village. Oh, no, no. I take you. Huh? What's that? I think to will be guide to Hori City. Here all is lost. Go back to Dalai Lama. What about pack animals? A village of Chomda, not far away. We'll go there first. Chanda was about ten miles away down the road. It was small, with only a few huts made of sun-dried bricks. Phil was afraid of the spring thaw that was setting in more every day, so we made arrangements with the native chief to start almost immediately. What do you say, Sing Tong? This Kiang's wild donkeys as good pack animals as other white men has. Oh. What's he talking about? What other white men? Ask him. A stranger leave here two days ago on way also to holy city of Rasa, where batch with crooked cross fill. Nazis. We're in a race, Esther. We've got to reach Lhasa before they do. That was the first we knew that the Germans were ahead of us, going in the same direction, on the same mission. Philip was right. It was going to be a race for time. Esther, come on. This is no time to pick flowers. Oh, look at this dwarf rhododendron, Phil. And up ahead, it's like a carpet of blue irises. Yeah, there'll be plenty of foliage until we cross the timber line. Then it'll just be cold, and traveling on snow is going to be a lot tougher. Well, I'm not looking forward to the temperature dropping 100 degrees in 20 miles. It... Oh, oh. Uh -oh. Watch it. You hurt yourself? No, I just tripped. I guess I must be getting tired. Is it sing too? Uh, yes, Mr. Yes. How soon will we be able to camp? Cold springs less than half a mile ahead. We'll camp there for night. <laughs> When we reached the springs, I started dinner out of K rations, which kept our packs light. And by the time I was through, the tent had mushroomed up, and Phil and Sing too were inside, straightening the pole and fixing the blankets for the night. How about food, Esther? Uh -huh. Soup's on. Vegetable. Mala. I looked up from the fire to find an unpleasant surprise. Six unpleasant surprises, carrying rifles and forming a ring of muddy boots all around me. Who are you, men? What do you want? Lala, Lala. Bill! What is it? Hey, you! Where'd they come from? I don't know. They're just here, that's all. We are. We are. Sing to? These are some of nomad bandits who raid my village. Huh? Niya, Shemo. What do they want? Kadia, Kadia. Kadan Zibang, Tanyo, Kadia. They say they take surprise, everything, a gods too. Goya, Teo, Solagli. Leader, shoot off gun to show you he mean what he say. Oh, Phil, without our supplies and guns, we'll have to turn back. Providing they let us turn back. Nothing, why am I? They hold you hostage. 
send me hore man back to get ransom. Oh, Phil. Hold on, hold on. Don't let them know you're afraid of them. We stood there while they gathered our supplies out of the tent and threw them in a heap by the fire. Sing too knew he wouldn't be harmed because he was a holy man, but Phil and I had no idea what was ahead for us. God, do you lie? Get your hands off me, you baboon! Oh, Phil! Leave her alone, you understand? <laughs> Sing too. <laughs> Tell them we'll come quietly. Go up! Falling! I said, get your filthy hands off me! The machine gun that riddled the bandit leader came from the direction of the brush. And the six of them went down, one after another. Then there was silence. And we looked up to see our two saviors walking out of the brush in German uniform. I'm delighted that we were able to be of assistance, Americans. I am Commandant Kurt Farbe of the German army. This is Lieutenant Ernst Kessler. Right, me. Thank you for saving our lives. I'm, I'm Esther Malden, and this is my husband, Philip. Oh, and our guards sing too. You do not seem uh, too surprised to uh, see us here. We're not. Just surprised you're not two days ahead of us the way we thought you were. Then you knew about us? How? They told us in the village. They also told us you were headed for the holy city. They talk too much, those native idiots. The clinics that's mouth hunter. Crash their ants. And um, you, um, are you also going there? No. Oh, I mean, uh, we're, we're geologists. We're just on an exploring expedition. <laughs> come, come. Is it quite nice to lie to your benefactors who have just saved your lives? I don't get that. Why did you? Well, we saw the American flag sewn on your clothing. That told us immediately who you were and where you were going. We, as you already know, we are also headed for Lhasa to the Dalai Lama. But our guide was killed. The snow loosened under him as we turned the ledge and he uh, fell. So you were going back for a guide? Exactly. But that is some distance away. Time is slipping by. You have the guide. You will lead us. Oh, no, we won't. And neither will sing too. Will you sing too? We'll do only as friend Americans tell me. The flukes are hot! Ah, Ernst, you get too excited over nothing. Now remember... Herr Morden, Frau Morden, you have the guide. We have your supplies and your weapons. Let us pool our resources. Go together. If you think that at the point of our own guns you're going to make us lead you to Lhasa, you're crazy. Look, you are scientists. I appeal to your logical minds. Is it not safer that since we are traveling the same direction, we travel together? Once we reach the Dalai Lama that each of us present the case of his country to him. If you'll forgive me for repeating, Herr Commandant, we're not going to be pushed along with guns in our backs. <laughs> nine, nine. <laughs> Who said you would be? Here. Why, Phil, he's giving us back our pistols. You see? We trust strangers, gentlemen? No. Not yet. It's all right. Go ahead, open them. Yeah, open the gun if you like. Go ahead, spin the drum. See the cartridges in the chamber. Yes. Yes, I see them. Well, we return your guns, loaded as they were. Now shall we forget the war for a while and travel on together? Okay. Let's try it. We're lagging behind them, Phil. Shouldn't we catch up to them? We will. I want to talk to you. Ooh, I'm, I'm cold. A temperature went down so fast once we crossed the timber line, I could almost hear it drop. Oh. What do you think of this situation? With our friends? I don't know what to think. You trust them? Of course I don't. Whether they gave us back our guns or not, they're still going to look for a chance to double-cross us before we reach the Holy City. What are we going to do, Phil? Just keep an eye out. Look for a way to double cross them first. Fred, Fred, clear brook here. Good water to drink. Come. Come, my friends. You hear what he says? Water. <laughs> that will taste better than the whiskey in your flask, eh, Al? We're coming. We caught up with them. 
And as we leaned over to fill our canteens from the small, clear brook, there was a sudden rumbling. Ah, the water's turned muddy suddenly. Yeah, it's covered with a dirty foam. Splashing to. Ren. What's he talking about? It is not raining. It is in the high regions. That's what turned the water. But so suddenly. It happens like that. Races along under the ground, pushing the mud with it. It's, it's really beginning to thaw, isn't it? Yes. That's what I was afraid of. What is there to be afraid of? Answer me. As the snow starts to melt, it'll start to fall. So just watch your step. <laughs> Ernst, is it not good to have three such good guides? <laughs> we are indeed fortunate, boss. <laughs> Come, more brook along the way. We walk. Walk? Why do you think we have these animals? Keong can be turned loose here. We'll get more and more snow. It's best to climb by foot. Yes, Sing Tu's right. Besides, the animals won't find any place to graze. It's been getting pretty sparse for miles. Mm, where will they go? They are wild. We'll find no own way. Hera! Hera! The packs were heavy, and we were too tired the next two days to do much talking. We just watched each other. The jagged paths under us were getting more and more slippery. And below the cliff, we could see a sheer drop of hundreds of feet to the glacier. Above us were the snow peaks. And somewhere beyond, the holy city of Lhasa, towards which small birds of dull brown, gray, and black seemed to point. And then, the third night after the strange pact had been made between our two enemy camps, it happened. Esther, where are you going? Oh, to the brook around the bend, Phil. I want to get some water. You take care of the rest. Now, if you pitch the tent, Herr Morgan, I'll fix the fire. Oh, by the way, where's Elm? Oh, there it is. I knew I'd seen a brook. Oh, ain't just a little bigger hole in the ice. Oh, yeah. Let me carry that back for you. Lieutenant Kessler, what are you doing here? I can see you don't want to be friendly. What a pity. I'll be friendly enough to give you some good advice. No. Save that liquor until you really need it. And stop guzzling it if you intend to keep up on this hike. This is no Boy Scout picnic. <laughs> I'm touched by your concern for me. Don't flatter yourself. What are you doing back here anyway? You really wish to know? I followed you. I knew you were coming to the brook. So I went round the other way. You what? You don't like me. You'd like me very much if you got to know me. No, thanks. Now, please, get out of my way and let me go back. Ah, <laughs> but Kleiner, we may not have another chance to be together alone. You are very attractive, even in those heavy clothes. Yeah, I know, very attractive. Besides, I'm the only woman for miles. Now get out of my way. Ah, I would like to see you in a white gown, diamond clips at your shoulders. Have you got nice shoulders yes. from Molden? Get me alone. Don't try to pull away Stop from it. me. Stop it, you drunken kiss. fool. Kiss. Oh, you big, dumb, drunken Nazi pig. You watch your dumb Get out of from me. Husband, oh. cut it out if you do not. Stop yelling, I say. Stop Phil. it. Stop it. Phil. Get away, Kessler. Get away. Leave her alone. And if I don't, you gave me back my gun, I'll use it. <laughs> you have your gun? <laughs> You would not dare shoot me. Go on, try it. Use your gun. Ernst, that is enough. You know, strong enough. Where's the talking the idiot? Do you want him to use his gun on you? Think, Ernst. Do you want him to use this gun? He will. I can tell he will. Mm, no, no. I give this lady your apologies. I order you. My apologies, Frau Morden. You both have my word. An incident like this will not occur again. Shall we eat and make camp for the night now? All the next day, Phil and Sing Tu kept me between them as we climbed. I wondered how soon we'd see the holy city, 
and when all this would come to a head. Look! When Sing Tu yelled, we turned around and looked in the direction from which we'd just come. A huge ice pillow swayed for a moment, and then... It, it landed on the path we had come from less than two hours before. Well, this is what we can expect from now on, now that the thaw is set in. Oh, well, I'll expect it, but I won't look forward to it. Oh, Phil, am I mistaken? Or are the days getting longer? Sleepy? Uh-huh. You know, it was nice of them to let you and Sing Tu and me have this cave to ourselves. Well, considering that it's too small to hold more than three of us, it wasn't so magnanimous. Still, they could have tried to grab it for themselves. Farber seems to be trying to make amends for the way his pal liked it the other day. I wonder what their game is. Yes, I'd like to know, too. Sing Tu? Yes. You wish to know how soon we reach Holy City? <laughs> he may not talk much, but he's a pretty good mind reader. That's it, Sing Tu. How long? Expect to see gates in distance, perhaps tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, that's wonderful. Is it? Well, isn't it? It means time's run out, Esther. If they're going to pull anything, they're going to pull it now. The Germans were camped under a ledge which protected them from the wind, about 50 feet from us across a narrow crevasse. In spite of all the things that had happened before, or might be going to happen ahead, it was strangely peaceful up there. In the west, a fan of pink rays from the sun shot up from behind the snow range, and overhead a few bright stars twinkled. Presently, the fan flickered and, and, and disappeared. And then, in the glow of the full moon, I saw what looked like a long procession of ghosts in the distance, but were actually cascades of snow melting and falling hundreds of feet, leaping from ledge to ledge. In the morning, the air was crystal clear. And we saw it. The holy city. Uh, Esther, do you see it? I expected only to return again. When I die. Oh, it, it's beautiful. How long will it take us to reach it? You will not reach it at all, my friends. Don't start something you can't finish, Herr Commandant. Phil. Get back, get behind me, back in the cave. You should have been more friendly to me, Frau Morgan. Perhaps I would have taken you with us. Uh, go on, throw your gun, shoot us. <laughs> go ahead. Watch the big joke. <laughs> sure. Do you think we would have been fools enough to give you loaded guns? <laughs> but I saw them. I broke open the gun and saw the cartridges. Did you take one out and examine it? <laughs> Why don't you do it now? Phil, look, I, I opened mine. It's a... It's a blank cartridge. Now, surely, Frau Morden, you understand why I took care not to let your husband become too excited the night Ernst here tried to be friendly. <laughs> I didn't want to take a chance of your finding out too soon. <laughs> we should give your regards to the Dalai Lama. <laughs> ah, shoot us. Go on. Kill us with your blank guns, if you can. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Esther. Ernst, look out! Back in the cave, quick. Phil took them at their word and actually killed them with his blank gun. The shots vibrated enough to loosen the heavily piled snow, break the crust at the rim of the ledge, and start the slide that avalanched down. It threw them over the side and buried them somewhere on the cliffs below us, under rock, ice, and snow. Gun? They are gone. Oh, the, the thaw worked for us, didn't it? Yes. Come on, Sing Tu. You lead. We'll follow.
We could see the holy city, but it was still 25 miles away. It was two days' travel of an almost vertical descent into the valley, and we arrived at dusk at the magnificent red and white palace that overlooked the city. It was a week before we saw the Dalai Lama. Our entrance into his presence was conducted with the utmost ceremony. Tall, grim-faced monks lined the hall, their six-foot-four-inch frames made even more massive by layers of stiff gold brocade. The walls were carved with strange images and Tibetan inscriptions. Then the gong struck again. And we were ushered into the throne room. Esther, look. Quiet. Must not talk. Come. Dalai Dama. We'll see you now. <laughs> We walked on thick rugs that were brilliant in color and depicted the waves of the sea, clouds, and emblems of happiness. Then we saw a throne of yellow satin at the end of the great room, and on it, robed in burgundy and gold satin, with a crown on his head and a table of jewels beside him, sat the Dalai Lama, a boy of six. Come closer. Come. I will throw... The silk longevity scarf over your heads to welcome you. We thank you for your welcome, your serenity. We bring you gifts from our leader. I accept your gifts with great thanks. How is your president? He is well, thank you. Bring the gifts to me. Let me see. They gave him the gifts, and he looked at each one carefully. After a while, servants began to pass bowls of rice and glasses of black tea. I noticed that a special taster took a sip of the llama's tea before it touched his sacred lips. Mr. and Mrs. Walton? Yes, Your Serenity? Throw a pinch of rice over your shoulder. It will bring good luck. Your Serenity... We've come to talk about peace and friendliness between our two countries. There is no need to talk. Come here. I tie three knots in your scarf. There. What's that? Saint George. Means only interview at an end. But we've accomplished nothing. His serenity has tied three knots in Americans' longevity scarf. He has blessed them. Our countries will be friends. The success of the mission of these two OSS geologists helped to lay the foundations of friendship between Tibet and the United States and to forestall any possibility of Tibet's cooperation with our Axis enemies. Thus, once again, the report of another agent ends with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Esther was Louise Barclay, Philip, Grant Richards, The Monk, Raymond Edward Johnson, Barber, Stephen Schnabel, Kessler, Barry Kroger. Others were Janice Gilbert, Carl Weber, Ralph Bell, and Jerry Jarrett. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of John Garth. Sound effects by Chet Hill and Dick Gillespie. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This program was produced by Louis G. Cowan and Alfred Hollander under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Programs, get your programs here. Mystery in action tonight on NBC. Hear how you may win a cash prize as an armchair detective on $1,000 reward. Listen to the adventures of the suave crime fighter The Saint, played by a screen favorite Vincent Price, and follow another exciting caper with the greatest private eye of them all, hard-boiled Sam Spade. Now stay tuned for High Adventure and The Big Guy on NBC.